Uh, first of all, thank you so much for joining us for a second session on the online workshop Religion and Science in COVID Times, Research Perspectives, uh, hosted by ISOR with the support of La Caixa Foundation. Um, I also would like to remind you that our sessions are being recorded, so please don't forget to remain your um, microphones muted. Um, the chat is going to be open for comments and questions and for our dialogue at the end of the presentation. As Ma mentioned in the beginning, my name is Rafael Casarin and I'm a postdoctoral fellow at ISOR, researching uh, mainly the intersections of religion, gender and science in Spain. And uh, for the re this reason, I'm more than excited to hear about our first session in which we are honored to have Dr. Paul Bramadat presenting the talk, Pandemics and Politics, Religion, Science and Vaccine Hesitancy. Um, Dr. Paul Bramadat is professor at uh, the Department of History and at the Religious Studies Program at the University of Victoria. Since 2008, he is also the director of the Center for Studies in Religion and Society. Um, Dr. Bramadat's work explores the ways we um, imagine religion, spirituality, uh, when talking about diversity, health, security, and civil society, mostly North America and Western Europe. Um, I must say that it was difficult to select one particular work from his extensive list of publications, but I'd like to mention two of his recent books. Um, one of them is Public Health in the Age of Anxiety, Religious and Cultural Roots, of vaccine hesitancy in Canada, co-edited uh, by with um, uh, Maurice Gray, Rial Roy, and Julie Bettinger, um, and also uh, the book Urban Religions Events: Public Spirituality in Contested Spaces, also edited by um, Madriera, Julia Martinez Arino, and Marian Burchard. Um, so um, it's an honor again to have you here, Dr. Paul. And I'll leave the floor, or let's say the screen, <laughs> to you. Thank you. Now let's see if this works. Okay, is that working? Yeah? Okay, good. Thanks very much, Raphael, for that uh, warm introduction. And thanks also to Mar for inviting me to be part of this uh, conversation. Uh, and I have to say also thank you for your fantastic introduction uh, of the general problematique that I think with the, the next couple of days will be um, allowing us to enter into. It was, you did a, such a great job, uh, as you always do, and it's just a really wonderful way to, to begin. So thanks very much for that. Um, I'm, I'm also always amazed, uh, you know, my European colleagues for whom English is their second, third or fourth language usually end up speaking it better than I do. So. I'll just try to try to follow in their footsteps, I hope. So um, today I want to introduce a set of questions or um, considerations that grow out of a research project that I did um, that Raphael mentioned, religion and, and uh, anxiety in public health. So the outline for today is, is fairly basic. I want to distinguish between what we normally think of as the religious and cultural roots of vaccine hesitancy. And vaccine hesitancy is kind of the the kind of term that epidemiologists use when they're talking about the broad range of approaches to vaccines from people who absolutely reject them to people who kind of, in some sense, curate them. In other words, they, they're okay with the polio vaccine, but not with the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine. So uh, epidemiologists refer to this as diff different variants of vaccine hesitancy. And we think of them as having resistance from capital R religious sources and, and cultural sources. Then I want to question the standard distinction between the cultural and the religious types or, or, or forms of vaccine hesitancy. And I think this actually is related quite closely to some of the comments Mar made earlier about the ways in which we often reify these distinctions between religion and science. And we, we tend to think in this secularization uh, paradigm, which I think we need to get beyond in some respects. I want to think as well about the world that's imagined by vaccine critics, uh, because it's important to try to enter into their imagination uh, about what they find objectionable about, about vaccines, but also the world they think of as being preferable. And then given the, the, the topic of today's and tomorrow's conversations, I want to reflect on what in particular COVID has to teach us about these questions and how we might connect 
some of the quite, you know, like decades of research on vaccine hesitancy with what's just happened this last uh, eight or nine months. So just a bit of a background on the book. Um, Anna Helfoff and I, uh, I think she's probably in her pajamas and watching, uh, she's on another screen, I think, if it's, I think, two or three in the morning. So hello, Anna. Anna and I were talking about the value of something like autoethnography for explaining how all of us or any of us get into the research projects that, that attract our attention. And I have to say, this, is, this book emerged out of um, a few friendships I had with people who I discovered were not planning to vaccinate their children. And uh, this led to all kinds of conversations and conflicts and some friendships ended. And I really wanted to enter into this imagination more deeply. Also, um, I met an epidemiologist uh, with whom I had these conversations about whether or not we should have a book on, we should have a research project in Canada on vaccine hesitancy because there had never been anything like it. And she said, you know, Paul, we just, we in the scientific field uh, who are bench scientists, in other words, white coat scientists, as well as sociologists of science, we just write these people off. He said, these, these people who have these concerns about the safety and efficacy of vaccines, they're just crazy. So we're going to actually not even think about or, or talk to them. We're going to focus instead on those people whose uh, approaches we can actually have some impact on. And I said, well, you know, geez, if you add up those people to the people for whom vaccines can't work because they're in chemotherapy or, or they're infants or the, and the people who actually take a vaccine and the vaccine simply doesn't work. In other words, there are failures, failures of vaccines. When you add up all those people, it gets to be sort of 10 to 20%. And that's actually too large a percentage to simply ignore. So this is why uh, we created this uh, research team and raised some money and it combines English Canada and French Canada. The team includes anthropologists, histori historians, sociologists, religious studies people like me, uh, also public health specialists at the policy level, but also at the practical frontline level. So nurses, um, family doctors, um, and also people from the government who are involved in this question at the, at the very highest level of the, the Center for Disease Control. So it was really pretty impressive. Um, I really loved the team that we put together. My job was to essentially create a space. My job is similar to Mark's in some sense, is to create a space and a kind of a climate for uh, a productive conversation where sometimes there was real tension. One of the people from the Center for Disease Control, when she was giving her uh, opening remarks at one of our conferences said, you know, if I could put vaccines in the water, I would do that. And everybody just stiffened, you know, and all of us said, uh, I think we, we understand the spirit of that comment, but let's try to uh, enter into what you're getting at here. So religious hesitancy, when we think, let's, let's talk about the two different types, so religious and cultural, and then we'll try to get past that. So in fact, religious hesitancy is, is fairly rare, um, and it, it is not usually at the root of major outbreaks, whether we're talking about Canada or other places. It does need to be still talked about, but it's, it's not the kind of dominant concern. So for example, some of you know that there is a small group of Catholics who have concerns about the ways in which certain vaccines are developed using the fetal tissue from aborted uh, fetuses. Um, in rubella, for example. That's a very, very small number. Even, even the Vatican supports uh, vaccines and, and treats that, that criticism as something which needs to be dealt with uh, with a general acceptance of vaccines. So um, these, this second type is somewhat more common, um, especially the second type, uh, the, you, what we would normally call fundamentalist forms of Christianity, um, usually Protestant forms where they have a, a view of, the, of God's plan for your body and God's plan for the world as being absolutely comprehensive. And so why are humans um, taking on any risk to their own bodies when if God wants you to get measles, mumps, rubella, diphtheria, polio, then God, that's God's plan for your life. And so why would you resist that? And so some of the outbreaks we've seen in Canada um, are linked to these communities, some of which are Dutch Reform or Christian Reform or Calvinist types of, of uh, small communities in British Columbia. So we can sometimes link it to those folks. And so, and this is another, so uh, one of the main points I want to make is that when we're thinking about vaccine hesitancy, 
there's a way in which global political orders and issues almost always appear in the, uh, on the horizon. And so we always have to be asking questions when we see outbreaks in Nigeria, Afghanistan, Pakistan, what are the kind of political historical conditions that gave rise to a particular type of um, increase in whether it's polio, measles, rubella, whatever it might be. And it's often the case in those three countries, for example, but you could use other examples, the where you can trace um, you can trace the resistance to a particular vaccine program back to the way in which these communities have experienced uh, international pressure, whether it's from the WHO or the CIA, which used a vaccine program to trace where Osama bin Laden was. And so it's no wonder that many of these communities begin to be a bit suspicious of white folks getting out of vans with white jackets and saying, here, trust me, this is for, the, this is for your own uh, benefit, right? Um, there were concerns as well about, about uh, international organizations trying to control fertility as well. So it's always important to ask questions about what the broader historical global political realities are that stand behind sometimes some of these increases in, in, um, in uh, vaccine present preventable illnesses. So now, in fact, the, the, the main sources of, um, of vaccine preventable illnesses are really what we think of as cultural. Now, that, this is a huge category, uh, and we don't have time to get into all of them today. Uh, there are a lot of sources, a lot of the sources combine, and some of the sources are in tension with one another. So I'm just going to list uh, seven of them. Uh, these are probably all, all sources that you're familiar with. One critique, of course, is that the, of government overreach. It's perceived by many people to be a kind of a threat to their autonomy that some government agency would tell them what ought to go into their, into their bodies. In Canada, there's been a lot of debate about mandatory flu shots for healthcare workers. So in, in some cases, you have trained nurses who say, well, I refuse to get, I refuse to have the government uh, impose on me a, fl a flu shot uh, especially uh, if they feel that the government doesn't have their best interests at heart. There is, of course, concern about what we, big pharma, um, and the concern that the pharmaceutical corporations, which are, after all, businesses, have hidden um, evidence of uh, problematic or deadly um, adverse effects. So that, that's a line of critique as well, of course. And the idea here is that there is a kind of a conspiracy of big business to keep the, the sort of shadow side of vaccine uh, rollout and research from the rest of us. There is as well, naturally, a critique um, of uh, feminists and others who note quite correctly, I think, that there has been a long history of um, white-coated male doctors telling women what to do with their bodies and the bodies of their children. Now, that is an absolutely legitimate concern. There is a long history of this in North America and Europe and, and elsewhere. Uh, but it gets bound up in or it gets drawn up into these concerns about uh, vaccines. There is, of course, the sense that natural approaches, whether it's homeopathy or any other intervention, Reiki or massage or yoga, are these that all natural approaches, so-called natural, are clean and superior and therefore ought to be preferred. There is a concern, uh, in some sense, this is the most legitimate concern about what goes into a vaccine. In other words, you're asking me to put something in my body or the body of my child. Well, what's in there? I, I'm, I'm not a chemist, so I'm having to rely on you to tell me that the ingredients, the ingredients that, that, that produce the vaccine, but also the ingredients like tamarisol that stabilize or, or protect the vaccine, you're asking me to trust that those ingredients are safe. I'm not, I'm not really sure I want to do that. And these are uh, concerns that people bring, quite legitimate concerns, they bring to the doctor's office. As well, there is this uh, kind of uh, grows obviously out of deeper uh, movements in our culture around relativism. The idea that science is really inconclusive, and so all you know, we don't really know yet uh, which which vaccines are effective. Um, and maybe since science is fallible, we should actually hold off on uh, vaccines. And then finally. Um, there is a concern around adverse effects. There are always adverse effects in any vaccine campaign. Um, of course, there's the most extreme adverse effect, which is death. And then there's the more common adverse effect, which is that your shoulder hurts or you feel a bit faint or you have flu-like symptoms. 
But adverse effects are uh, some of the biggest uh, anxieties that people have when they think about whether or not they're going to accept any amount of risk for their own bodies or their own kids' bodies in exchange for or in order to advance you know, broader public health objectives. So when we think about the, um, the fundamental difference between these two forms, we normally say this. We normally say, well, look, religious forms of vaccine hesitancy or rejection, they're rooted in a transcendent, eternal, a priori, non-rational, irrational, anti-science, I mean, all the kind of dichotomies that Marr referred to in her opening remarks. And then we say, well, cultural forms of, of hesitancy, they're this worldly, they're imminent, they're practical, rational, scientific, they are in some sense more legitimate, you can reason with them. This is in some sense behind the whole project that, that this, uh, my, my talk is based on. The, was my comment from my, my call, the comment from my colleague that, look, we're not going to talk to these religious people, they're insane. We're only going to talk to the people who have cultural, legitimate, practical concerns around ingredients. Okay, but here's the problem. When you look at these, some of you may not have heard the term disappearogram, but it's this wonderful English term I, I want to hereby give to my European uh, friends. Uh, a disappearogram means this. So this is, this is a, a chart which gives you some sense of what happened to polio in the United States when a vaccine was developed in 1955 and then 1961, different types of vaccines. And then you get the, this, basically the same chart when measles vaccines were introduced in 68 and later. And then you get um, chickenpox vaccines. And you, so you basically these, these charts are the same, aren't they? They're basically, this is why they call them disappearograms, to capture the, the general story that is being told in the public health and epidemiological world, which is that these things are incredibly effective. They're probably second only to clean water in terms of reducing unnecessary suffering. And so scientists, they just think like, what is wrong with you people? Can you not see this? Like this is pretty compelling evidence. What do you, what's wrong with you people? Do you want to be on the left side of the graph or on the right side of the graph, right? So they just don't understand what's wrong with people. And they just, they just feel like, okay, you know, I can't, even, I can't even reason with a person who can't see this, right? So um, my job, I felt in the project was to say, okay, when you, when you have people who look at these graphs, and you can show graphs like this for virtually every vaccine preventable illness, when you have people who look at these graphs and say, no, no, I'm still not going to get the vaccine, then you're looking at, a form of resistance or concern or anxiety which is in our wheelhouse, which is in the wheelhouse of sociologists of religion or anthropologists of religion. So then we have to look at what might be fundamental similarities between these two broad cohorts of resistance. And let's say, again, for lack, for lack of a, uh, we don't have time to go into all these, but let's, let's um, consider this possibility that both forms, the, the cultural and the, and the religious, um, assume that there are forces behind the scenes, kind of hidden forces that are actually shaping the world and keeping people ignorant about, about the way the world really works. Both assume, of, of course, that the world is orderly and manageable. In other words, that there is an explanation for things, whether that explanation is God's plan or that explanation is some kind of conspiracy between big, big pharma, big government, or big gender. Um, both are rooted in twin crises. Again, I'd love to spend more time talking about this on another occasion. Deep doubts about dom definite dom uh, dominant definitions of truth and trust. So we're, we're seeing a lack of trust or a decline in trust in medical professionals, for example, and tremendous confidence in the minds of patients that they can diagnose themselves. Patients often come into doctor's offices or into nursing clinics already having determine what their problem is and they simply tell the doctor well I have rheumatoid arthritis or I have you know high, high blood pressure and the doctor is in some sense uh, a secondary um, actor in this drama. Um, both are rooted in distinctive soteriological um, orientations in other words there is a way in which there is a salvation that is possible in, in these, these narratives whether it's through uh, a vaccine or sorry, whether it's through revealing the conspiracy uh, between big pharma, big government, uh, or whether it's in God's will turning uh, itself to you and your, and your wellness. Now again, echoing Mars' opening comments, 
all concerns, the, the religious ones or the cultural ones, are negotiated, they're situated, they're specific to the time and place. Um, and neither one, neither form is especially or uniquely resistant to reason or engagement. Though the general assumption is that the religious form is intransigent, impossible to have conversations with, and so forth. And that's something I, I, I want to challenge. I've actually found more intransigence among people I know who are resistant to vaccines for what we would call cultural reasons. So now let's think about what beyond the no, what happens. So vaccine hesitancy is not just about saying no. It, it does reflect pervasive doubts about what we might think of as the global economic uh, and medical status quo. But it's also an affirmation of some other perspective about the way the body might work. So again, we don't have time to go into all these, but provisionally, what are they saying yes to? In other words, what is their imagined body in this case? And what is their, and what is their critique of vaccine um, politics? What does it grow out of? So first, let's say that it, it grows out of the notion um, that the, the, the body is somewhat perfectible. So you were trying to liberate the mind and the body from all strictures and structures. It grows out of a sense that the body, that the world has been made uh, ugly and tainted and, that, and sort of flattened. And that in fact, their world is full of beauty and mystery and awe and appreciation of the you know, gorgeousness of the world. It grows out of a sense of universalism, a sense that we are all one um, species, or we are all part of one um, project, and that the new media and technologies actually are not viewed negatively in this context, it's viewed really positively as a means of understanding these communitarian realities. There is a strong theme or a strong part of the subtext that is neo-apocalyptic. In other words, there is a sense that this is an absolute end of, of normality, right? We talk about the new normal, for example, and the, the idea that, that the world is never going to be the same after this. Remember, many of you remember when the, when the uh, uh, pandemic began, we all sar started seeing these images on Facebook and elsewhere of dolphins showing up in Venice, right? And th there was a story that, well, the world is going to, is going to suddenly see how things really are and this will change everything it'll change economics it'll change politics it'll change gender relations it'll change science and yet and this is a fundamentally positive perspective that the, we're you know the, the world is forcing a kind of a global revolution upon us there is a, a wish for a coherent comprehensive trustworthy meta narrative uh, kind of a defragmentation um, of of the world and a cleansing, there is a strong sense of an ambient toxicity. You know, the, the sense that there is something about our water, our air, the clothing we wear, our, you know, the cell phone, the, the energy that is emitted from our cell phone, that is emitted from our fridges, our microwaves. There's a sense in which we have polluted the world and these perspectives are trying to recover the inherent purity, if you will, of the body, the mind, the spirit. And finally, uh, for some people, there is a strong sense that this pandemic, for example, and other uh, massive um, pandemics uh, like the Spanish flu um, is a kind of an opportunity to correct or to understand social and economic injustices that actually also keep people ill. So uh, what's a way forward? Well, first of all, let's think about what doesn't work. What seems to not work, and this, this, is, a, this is a fairly strong um, consensus within the research, is more and better data. Many clinicians and, and uh, scientists feel like, well, if a person comes into my office and they're, and they're saying they're not gonna vaccinate themselves or their kids, uh, I'm just gonna give them a better pamphlet or a better website or show them those disappearograms. And they're gonna look at those and kind of go, uh, okay, that's enough. You know, in other words, the idea is that the mind is not the best way or even the only way to uh, to convince a person. Second, um, the some of us, my, my friend or my colleague who said, you know, I would put vaccines in a water supply if I could. 
right? That is, of course, what many that, you know, cultural, culturally hesitant people are anxious about, this kind of authoritarian, muscular, top-down response. And finally, I think here, uh, recourse to mockery. Um, but it's difficult because actually there's a, there's a way in which some of the claims and concerns that people have um, in the backseat hesitant world are kind of ridiculous. And so some of you have probably seen these uh, images on your Instagram and Facebook accounts. Uh, this is, you know, of course, people use humor to cope with uh, challenging situations and to make light of them and to find a way to live the, their way through them. So these kind of capture some of the critique uh, from vaccine positive people about vaccine hesitant people. So if we have some sense here of what doesn't work, so cognitivism, authoritarianism, and condescension, let's think maybe um, about what does work. What seems to work at this point, and the, the research, the consensus is growing on this, is uh, long-term relationships with hesitant people and families. In other words, a person comes into your office, they say they don't wanna get vaccinated for this or that or for anything, uh, instead of just saying, okay, in fact, there are some physicians in North America who simply say, you can't actually be my patient if you're not gonna vaccinate yourself or your children. I won't accept patients who don't do that. And the research now suggests that actually the best way to convince people is to, en is to enter into long-term relationships. Second, and this is extremely challenging, trying to find ways to convince doctors and scientists and others that actually all of us are, all of us use ways of thinking that are a mix between the magical and the rational, the, the romantic and the nostalgic, the scientific, all of us, all of us here even, use this, um, this mix. And if you can develop that sense of your own mixed methods, as it were, your own mixed imagination, perhaps you can be a bit more patient when people come into your, into your arena, whether it's your patients or your friends, and you can develop a bit more capacity to tease out what's actually going on in their imagination. And then if governments and corporations, you know, big, big government and big pharma can be a bit more transparent about their, uh, their um, products and their policies, that would be useful. There are deep challenges, of course. Um, it's extremely expensive for the state um, to pay for, or for insurance companies to pay for unlimited number of visits from hesitant parents or hesitant patients. That's just extremely uh, expensive. Uh, there are human consequences of patients as well. For, so if you simply say, if a patient comes in and says, well, I'm not gonna, I've, I've heard that putting too many vaccines into a child too early, it's a real problem, so I'm gonna wait until she's four years old or five years old. Uh, well, then the chance that the, that kid is going to develop very serious illnesses early on goes up, right? So there are actual uh, consequences to that. And governments and corporations, for lots of reasons, are extremely uneasy about transparency for economic reasons, but also for sort of public uh, security reasons. And finally, the polarization, especially in the United States, but elsewhere as well, is so extreme in the public arena right now that it's really difficult to have open-minded, slow types of conversations. Um, so in a nutshell, uh, the distinction between cultural and religious forms of hesitancy prevents us from seeing some of the commonalities that exist between these two forms, understanding the sort of deep crises of trust and truth would help us understand things better, I think. And uh, vaccine hesitancy is always about more than vaccines. Uh, vaccines are actually often a fairly trivial sort of presenting phenomenon. What's actually often at, at stake are questions around economics, inclusion, politics, and other things. So as Mar pointed out, COVID um, has revealed many things um, that we now see more clearly. Uh, we won't go into all of these. All of these things I think will be familiar to you, and, and Mara mentioned several of them. We see structural inequalities in terms of who's dying more often. We see uh, latent or some uh, brand new mental health problems that our cultures can't really uh, deal with very well. We see all kinds of contradictions within neoliberalism uh, around fetishization of autonomy and a kind of a naive uh, celebration of globalization. We see in the US elections all kinds of ways in which these, um, in which especially social media and opportunism tended to massively multiply 
uh, misinformation uh, online. And Anna is going to talk about uh, these last two things tomorrow, I think. Um, but that we've seen in some ways, for many of us, almost the heartbreaking openness of alternative spirituality subcultures, yoga, Reiki, meditation, and so forth to some of these conspiratorial orientations. It's been quite uh, interesting, alarming, and really for sociologists of religion, it's extremely interesting opportunity to enter into the ways these things manifest. So uh, just finally, um, I know that we'll be talking about this over the next couple of days, but if I had to think about ways in which the current pandemic um, relates to the previous work on vaccine hesitancy, and might manifest itself in new research projects. I've sort of just made a list of, um, you know, I think five or six core questions I would want to ask and research projects I would want to undertake. So many of you know, there have been recent announcements about um, two very promising vaccines on the horizon that should roll out over the next couple months. These are actually different types of vaccines. You know, most vaccines rely on uh, the introduction of a, an attenuated or inert or inactive form of a pathogen into your body to which your body then reacts, producing antibodies which then can respond to the actual pathogen if you ever meet it in the future, right? That's the normal way in which we think of vaccines. But mnra vaccines are, are, are different. They're actually more subtle, more clever. And the question is, do conspiritualities or do conspiracy theories that are also, as it were, spiritually informed, how responsive are they to these new scientific innovations? Because they're going to have to reimagine their critiques because the MNRA approaches are, oh, the MNRA uh, vaccines are, are, are quite different. So it's an opportunity for us to think about how nimble conspiritualities can be. Right when when Jesus didn't come back uh, after you know uh, several decades, you saw the Christian community scrambling to think about how to integrate this fact, this disturbing fact, into their story. Right. So when prophecy fails, in other words, when 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 the world doesn't develop as one thinks it will or should, how does one respond? So as well, to what extent are humans equipped to think globally? So we this this tension between the local and the global. Is interesting. Science often presents itself as the, the sort of meta narrative for understanding the way the world works, the body works, and the way we move into the future. Um, but actually, it's you know, science lands in a global, in a local context. Whether that's in Australia, in the United States, Canada, Spain, it has a specific flavor, a specific local expression. And so, what happens when scientific norms differ country by country? The American norms around science and health are very different than the Canadian norms and we're separated by a, a very thin border. Um, some jurisdictions in North America and Europe have different ways of responding to or integrating alternative spiritual healing modalities, whether it's massage, yoga, reiki, um, chiropractic. To what extent have these things had an effect on death rates, infection rates, compared to societies where they operate according to a, a more strictly positivistic model of, of well health and wellness. So most um, capital R religious communities have been quite pro-vaccine. In fact, it's, it's really an exception that you would have um, religious communities opposed to vaccines. But what difference does it make? By, by difference, I mean in, in infection rates and death rates, so uh, if, you take, if you take out the pro-vaccine comments that religious communities might make, would you expect to see any difference in infection or death rates? And finally, for those of us interested in what's happening to religious communities in societies that are secularizing in, in various ways, what impact will these forced closures have on some of these communities that are really struggling? So in North America right now, or at least in Canada, many of the sort of big Christian denominations are really hemorrhaging members. It's, it's, uh, they're really uh, facing tremendous difficulties. Um, some of them are almost, you know, their, their numbers are almost dropping off a cliff. So what's going to happen when the vaccine does roll out? And so let's say six months down the road and um, the government says, okay, you can go back to church now. But some of these, some of these communities where their church, where, where, where their average age is 65, 70 years old, and they're now, they're now told, and they've been getting used to, to some extent, getting used to, 
doing church from home via Zoom and they're told they can go back to church now, what difference might that make to some of these communities that were already kind of in a pretty um, dire situation? And so will, will this, will this um, hasten some of their ultimate deaths of some of these communities? Or will it create an opportunity for them to think outside of the church building and to stay on Zoom perhaps for some people? So these are some just new avenues for research that I think we might consider as we um, go forward. So I think I'll just end my remarks there and then um, engage in broader conversation with you folks. Thank you.